So at this point we're ready to start decompiling, and we'll start at the top of WinMain. I'll double click on the first function call to get its initial decompilation. Now the first thing to notice are these magenta colored calls. These are system calls, and they're very useful for understanding what's going on because they're documented. It's quite clear what this function is doing. First it loads the shell32 library and gets the address of the sh git special folder path function from the library. If the function exists, it calls it to retrieve some special folder path, probably within the user's profile directory. In any case, it creates some folders to store the game data and like where the saved games are. So let's rename this function. Put the cursor here and press N, you can change the name. Call it create user directories. I'll move the box here so you can see. I still don't know what this parameter does, but we'll find out soon. Now we can choose to look up the documentation for SHGIT special folder path if we want. Normally I would not, because I already understand what this function is doing, and it's more important to move on with the next piece of code. But since it helps to demonstrate a couple features, I'll do it. You can highlight it and put it in the clipboard. Switch to Mozilla. So we can see that the function takes a window handle, returns a string in the second parameter, and the third parameter is the type of folder that we want. It's the CSIDL enumeration. And the fourth is a boolean that tells it whether it should be created if it doesn't already exist. Similarly, create directory takes the path in the first parameter and some security attributes in the second parameter. So we can see that the uh, first parameter A1, we can uh, put the cursor here on it and press Y to change the type. So we know it's a window handle. We can give it a name by pressing N to match that. Second, these hard, these magic numbers, 5 and 1, we can make them look nicer by putting the cursor here on them and pressing M. You can normally change the display by right-clicking on it. However, the, uh, actually it is here, choosing enum or pressing M will allow you to choose a, a symbolic name to replace the number 5. It says no defined enum uh, has value 5. We can look through the standard enums. If you remember, this was a CSIDL. And here it is, CSIDL My Documents. And the last one was a Boolean. We can press M and f use the symbolic value true. And similarly with the directories, this is not false, but rather a pointer, no. Now you don't have to uh, update all these if you don't want to. But it makes the function look nicer, like it would in real code. These zeros for the pointers are especially unimportant, but I'll do it here anyway. Finally, there are these hexadecimal numbers here. If you convert them to decimal, you see that the value is 260. Now, if you're familiar with C programming, you might recognize this as the value of the max path um, definition on a Windows machine. This is the length of a maximum, the maximum length of a file path in Windows. So if you look here in the enum view, you can also find the symbol max path and put this here to make it clearer what it's doing. And <clears throat> this one here is max path plus one. It, this doesn't really look very good, this max path uh, ORD with 1. But we can go into here, the enums view, press plus on the keypad to expand it, and press N to create 
a new actually it says this is a bit field but it's not so we can edit the enum and remove this bit field check uncheck the bit field checkbox and now you can press n to create another value we'll call it max path plus one and if we go back here hit f5 to refresh it now has this value. The reason max pass plus one is often used is uh, one character is reserved for the null terminator at the end. So now we have a choice. We can be satisfied with that we understand what this function does and go back to winmain, or we can investigate all these subroutines. And well, let's look at the first one. So all it's, this does is it takes a pointer and sets the first byte of what's pointed to to zero. And if you look at it, it's passing the address of a character. So basically this looks like just a fancy way to set this character to zero. Um, it's not exactly clear what it's doing. And one thing that can help us decide whether we want to investigate further is to place the cursor here and press X to see where this function is used. As you can see, it's used in quite a lot of places. At least a couple hundred places. And if you look at the others, this is used in even more places. Several hundred. And this one, in even more. Probably over a thousand. So since these um, functions are so widely used throughout the program, it would be good for us to understand them, since we're going to be seeing them again and again. So since this one doesn't really make much sense on its own, let's go to the next one. If you look here, now this has two arguments. Before it just had one. If you go back, you can see that it was corrected. And now that uh, you can see that these two arguments, the first argument, are the same. So these are in fact connected to the same data type. Um, so if you convert this to decimal, you see that it's the same number. So what it's doing is it's taking a pointer and copying up to 700 characters from a string into that pointer. And then it's null terminating it. So we know that the thing being pointed to is actually at least 701 bytes in length. 700 plus 1. And uh, since this is just one character, which is only one byte in length, it's a, bit, it's a bit suspicious. But if you look at the placement of these variables on the stack, you can see that there's quite a large distance between this variable and the next one. This is at 110 hex, and this is at 3d0 hex. And if you use the calculator, shift slash, you can type um, an expression in here and see that these are in fact 704 bytes apart. So, instead of being a single character, it's likely that this is in fact an array of characters, or perhaps even a structure, of at least 701 bytes in size, and at most 704 bytes in size. Um, before we change the type of this variable, let's look at the other functions. Uh, given the pattern we've seen so far, it's quite likely this will turn out to have two parameters. And again, this does something very similar. In fact, it's almost identical. Except that instead of uh, calling string copy, it calls string cat. So what this does is appends to the string. And if we click on this to highlight it, the only other one is this locale update get locale t which just returns the pointer it's given. That's kind of strange. We'll come back to it later. And there aren't any other calls to relating to this variable. So these three functions are the only three that we know about relating to this variable. So what this could be, this could just be a char 700 or 701 but since this, these functions are called in so many places throughout the code base, and since it would be unclean for the programmers to 
hard code the length of the buffer in every function, it's more likely that that this is actually a structure. And in any case, we can choose to represent it however we want. So we'll represent it as a structure. Now remember I said that we know the structure is at least 701 bytes and at most 704 bytes. The difference is not very great, but in other cases it may be. And when you have a choice to make a structure larger or smaller, you should always make it smaller. Similarly, if a bunch of variables are used together and you don't know whether they belong to one large structure or two smaller structures, you should always pick the two smaller structures. The reason is that it's easy to make a structure larger if you need to, but sometimes it's not easy to make it smaller. IDA Pro often won't allow you to reduce the size of a variable if you mistakenly make it too large, and the only thing you can do is undefine it, which for a local variable means deleting and recreating the whole function and having to decompile it from scratch. So err on the side of making things smaller. So we'll call this structure a string buffer. And the defaults here are fine. So now we need to add fields to the structure. There are two keys for doing this. One is the D key, which adds a numeric field. And you can press it multiple times to change the size of the field. DB is one byte, DW is two bytes, and DD is four bytes. This stands for define byte, define word, and define double word, respectively. You can press U to delete a field. Another option is to press A, which adds a string. It's a shortcut, really. And it asks for the array size here, since we know it's at least 701 bytes. And we don't want to make the structure any bigger than we have to. We'll uh, define it as 701 bytes. And we'll press N to rename it. We'll call it S text. Now another way to have done that is to press DB and uh, press the asterisk key on the keypad. Change it to 701 bytes, which you won't do because it will enlarge the structure. And then press Y and change the type to char pointer, or rather char, and then the, the size here. Um, using A to create a string is a shortcut for that. So now that we've defined the structure, we'll go here and uh, change the type of this variable by pressing Y, and we'll say struct string buffer. Now it's warning us that the variable is larger than the old one, and that if it overlaps with these other variables, they'll be destroyed. And um, we actually, we've measured the distance between these two variables with the calculator. So we know that it'll fit. But in other cases, you want to be careful. Because as I said, if you destroy these variables, the only way to get them back is to delete the function, recreate it, and start decompiling it again from scratch. I'll give it a better name by pressing N. We'll just call it Path. Now another thing I should have mentioned is that when I did the did the um, subtraction between these two variables, I assumed that this variable is not part of the structure. Now it could have been the case that these other variables belong to the structure as well. However, in this case, this v17 is part of this um, stack corruption protection code that we've seen before. So it's because of that, this is very unlikely to be part of the structure. And so I assume that uh, this variable was the end of the structure, or the limit. In other cases, there may be multiple variables here that all belong to the same structure. So now that we have this variable, we can start going through these functions. Now, this function actually makes a lot more sense now. First thing we'll do is we'll click on the first parameter and press Y to change the type. It's a pointer to a string buffer. And as you can see, what it's doing is simply setting the first byte to zero, which if you know about C programming, means it's um, setting it to an empty string. It's, no t it's immediately terminating the string. So what we can call this is string buffer clear.
and it's not exactly clear whether it's actually returning whether we need it to return a uh, pointer to the string buffer or whether it's um, not actually returning anything at all. We'll assume for now that it does actually return a pointer to itself. Now one thing I want to mention so you can change the return type of the function by placing the cursor anywhere before the parameters and pressing Y and you get the signature of the function. You have to be careful about just starting typing in here because in some cases it'll autocomplete and you'll uh, lose the whole the whole signature and if you exit and if you're too hasty and you press OK uh, you can be very hard to get the original signature back if you don't remember it. So be careful in this dialog. So I think we're done decompiling this and you can right click in and mark it as decompiled. I'm not sure what that really does except make it green in various places. And let's go through these other ones as well. So we know the first pointer is actually a string buffer pointer and second one is the string that we want to copy into the buffer. Let's just call this x as text. Now you'll see this kind of thing a lot. If you see that this pointer is assigned to v2 which must which means it must also be a string buffer pointer. And we'll give it the name p this. The reason for this is um, because if you look here on the right side that this pointer is st actually stored in a register, the ECX register, which you can see in blue text. And the this p this variable is stored in on the stack and the local variable. This is because of the this call convention, which mean which requires the first parameter to be passed in ECX rather than on the stack. And sometimes the compiler will need ECX for something else in which case it'll need to store it temporarily into a variable. So you'll frequently see that this pointer being assigned to a local variable, in which case you may need to propagate the type and the name. Um, once, once again, you can change the type of the function because it doesn't return a character point. character pointer but the string buffer pointer. And I think we're done with uh, we need to rename it string buffer we'll call it set. And we'll do the next one as well. Since this one appends to it, call it string buffer append. And the last function to accept uh, a string buffer is this locale update git locale t function. And since it, it just takes a pointer, it turns the same pointer. But for the string buffer, it doesn't appear to have anything to do with the locale. I'm pretty sure this is a mistake on the part of IDA Pro. IDA tries to look at the code of functions and match them against well-known standard library functions. And since this function is so simple, it probably mistook it for an identical function within the standard library. So I'm going to assume that what this function really does is take a string buffer and return a C-style string pointer. And if we're wrong, we can fix it later. So this here is a mangled name, but I'll call it string buffer get string. Now what this really is doing is not returning a pointer to the string buffer. Actually this is the wrong signature.
What this is really doing is not returning a pointer to the structure, but a pointer to the first field in the structure, the S text field. However, a pointer to the first field in the structure is identical to the point a pointer to the beginning of the structure. So the decompiler can't tell the difference. If we were in the disassembly view, we could actually go here and tell it to display it. We could choose force zero offset field to force it to display it as a pointer to the first field rather than to the structure itself. But the decompiler doesn't have that option, as you can see. So instead, we'll just use a comment to show what it's really doing. And once again, we'll mark that as decompiled and we're done. Now one thing you can do, if you're mixing disassembly and decompilation, is you can decompile the code with the hex race decompiler, and then choose this copy to assembly feature, which will copy your comments and the your comments and the decompile code into the assembly listing. This can be useful if you're mixing the two, but I think we'll stick with just the decompiler for now. And with that, the only thing left is this uh, global variable, which appears to be a path. I'm not terribly interested in what is... Uh, Okay, so you can see that this global variable is set to the capitalism2 directory. So let's rename it to cap2 user directory. And with that, I think we're done with this function. Oh. One final thing is the return value. IDA Pro often thinks functions return a value when they do not. This is because uh, values are returned in the EAX register, and it's difficult to tell the difference between a program putting a value in the EAX register for the purpose of returning it, and putting it there for some other purpose. The program doesn't check the results of any of these other directory creation attempts, and moreover, this function is called in only one place, in WinMain, and WinMain doesn't use the return value either. So I think, in fact, this function doesn't return a boolean. So we can go here and change this to void. And you can see that you removed the unnecessary return keyword. In this case, it had a negligible, negligible effect on the function. But in some cases, correcting the signature in this way can clean up the function a lot. You have to be careful about this, though, because if you make a function void when it's really not, it can screw up IDA's analysis of all the functions that call it. So don't do it unless you're sure. And with that, I think we can say this function is done. Now we're back in WinMain, and we can see that WinMain is using a string buffer too. So we'll first fix the name of this. It's not really a this pointer. It seems to be used as a path for file names. We'll just name it path. Now we could continue on with the next call in WinMain, but I'd like to continue with the string buffer. Since it's a fundamental data type that's used all over the program, it would be a good idea to see if there are any more string buffer functions to decompile. This way, when we decompile a function that calls a string buffer function, IDA Pro will be able to automatically figure out the types of the local string buffer variables and name them. Since the names and types are usually assigned the first time a function is decompiled, it's good to give IDA as much information as you can before then. So one way to do this is to note, make use of the fact that in C programming, functions are often grouped together in the same file, and the same C file, which means they'll be placed roughly in the same place within the executable. So what we can do is to search for some of the string buffer functions inside of uh, this functions window and look for other functions around them. Now this one doesn't have any string buffer functions around it, but if we sort by function name we can see
we can see that um, the other functions are grouped around 5e1 hex and we'll go to the first one which is here and we can simply sort by the address again you see that these are grouped together now there's a very good chance that in between these and around these are other string buffer functions so let's start by looking by going up from the first one we decompile this and it doesn't look related decompile the previous one it doesn't look related either so let's go down decompile this one and we've seen this kind of thing before in fact this is definitely another string buffer function so let's decompile all these as well and this actually is a, a direct copy of the string buffer set function we saw before and you may be wondering why there are two copies of the same function my guess would be that one of them is a constructor and one of them is simply a function that sets uh, a string buffer after it's already been constructed and the two happen to have the same code there's no real way for us to tell so I'm just going to call this um, string buffer set 2 <coughs> now I'm not going to fix the signatures right away because it it messes up the it puts those as the first choice in this uh, auto completion for the type name I'm going to come back and fix them later let's look at the next one this is clearly also a string buffer function well because it has 701 here and we know that that's the size of the string buffer structure <coughs> so let's look at this unknown lib name now this is quite complicated and arcane however if you know about C programming it should be pretty apparent what this function is if you look at this it, it appears to be checking something against the range and uh, if it's in the range it does something if it's not in the range it calls memcopy basically and this looks very much like uh, an optimized memcopy loop so I'm going to say that this is the memmove function from the standard C library and we can give it the right signature it takes the void pointer destination void pointer for the source and the um, number of bytes to copy Oops. and what does it return <coughs> actually don't remember what what it returns it appears to return the final <coughs> end of the buffer so it's not an integer but another void pointer <clears throat> now the first one is now that we know this is memmove we can we know that it's going to be overriding one string buffer with something so let's take a look at how this function is actually used we'll press x to get the places where this is used I actually don't know what this is about um, sometimes it fails to decompile some complex functions but we can usually those are in certain well, we'll just not ignore that for now so we can see that this function is called with v6 which if we scrolled up well, we can see that the second parameter is definitely a string buffer v6 we don't know what it is it may well be a string buffer as well so we can look for some other places where it's used so it has this which is a string buffer and a1 which we don't know for sure so let's go back there so we know that the second parameter is a string buffer pointer and we know that memmove because of the way memmove works this is going to be 
the source. Now I'm going to just take a guess here and assume that this sec first parameter is also a string buffer and that what this function does is to um, overwrite one string buffer with the value of another. So I'm going to call this string buffer not move because that implies that the contents are removed from one of them, but perhaps save copy, which is what memmove really does. Let's look at the next one. This does not appear to be This might be some kind of string buffer related function since it passes the first parameter to string length. However, this is, despite being frequently used, it's not really clear what this is about. It's pretty convoluted. So we'll just skip over it, and if we run into it later, we'll think about it harder then. The next function is this one, which Well, we can do this one immediately first. This one is probably a function that returns the length of a string buffer. Although we can't be sh sure, so we'll look at places where it's used and see if it's... Um, yes, we can see that it is used with a string buffer. So we'll call this string buffer get length we'll go back to here see if we can figure out what this is doing so since this takes a string buffer we know that this is also a string buffer and appears to be copying the string buffer into some global variable and uppercasing it and then returning it. And it's possible that this is a 701 byte buffer. But we don't really know for sure what this function is doing. It may just uppercase the string buffer and return it, but again, since it's not immediately obvious, we'll come back to it later if we need to. So if we look here, we can see another string buffer related function. Uh, this calls string string to search for one string within another and we can see where it's used. We can try to see if it's used with a string buffer, and it is. So we know that the first parameter of this is a string buffer, and uh, we'll assume that it's searching for the index of a string substring. So we'll call this s substring. And we know this is a string buffer. And this is a substring. Now, if I recall correctly, string string returns the, the a pointer to the first instance of a substring within this string. So this is going to be the uh, pointer to the substring, and which means that this is the, let's see, it takes the, basically the index 
where the substring is found. And then since this is a pointer, a better name would have a P on there. Once again, this function appears to copy one string buffer over another, which is a duplicate of the other function we already have. And once again, this is a question of why there are two copies of the same thing. And I think the answer is the same. It's likely one of them is a copy constructor, which creates a copy of another string buffer, whereas this is whereas the other one is a simply a function that um, sets the value of an existing string buffer and they have the same code Let's call it save copy 2 Now this one is interesting and quite complex. It passes in a value and then a constant 1. And we can see here it's called L2A, which takes an integer and converts it into, a, into text. And it stores it in this buffer. We can see that this is the only place in the whole program using that buffer. So let's rename this to L2A buffer and what this seems to be doing is if it's positive then this is zero and if it's negative then it makes it positive and says and remembers that it's negative. So this appears to be some kind of a flag to check if it's uh, negative, so we can call it b is negative, and this is a value for magnitude. This is the digits from the number, this is the length of the number, it's calling string len. Um, these numbers here, 40, 36, 44, 37, 41, you may recognize them as common ASCII characters. Uh, so if just on a hunch we try to show this as a character, you can see that it kind of makes some sense here. These are all reasonable characters. So it's pretty clear that this is a function to format a number and um, based on the second parameter it will format it in different ways. If this is 2, it formats it as currency. If it's uh, 4, it's going to not put digit, um, digit separators here. If it's 3, it formats it as a percent. In, in any case, if it's negative, it surrounds it with parentheses. So it's, this is clearly a function to format a number. And it stores the result in this buffer, which again is only used in this one program. So we can call this um, num format buffer. Prefix it with the G to note that it's global.
Now this format code two, three, four is something we should create a, an enumeration for so you don't have to remember the meanings of the numbers. So we'll do that here by pressing insert to create a new enum. We'll call it enum format. Um, it's actually decimal, we'll display it in decimal. We'll add some new values to it based on what we know. So we have number format two, which is current, which put a dollar sign on there. We'll call it NF currency. Um, pressing N, we can create another one. Three, which was percent. Four, which was no digit groups. Then we can change the type of this by pressing Y and choose enum, enum format and it still displays it as 2, 3, 4, etc. But we can press M or use the right click menu to change how it's displayed. And so here it is, enum format. So let's do this here, enum format, no digit groups, and a percent. And uh, instead of returning a buffer, well, first of all, instead of this being a byte array, it's actually a char array. And that means this function returns a character pointer. And let's call this format number. So this function does the exact same thing for whatever reason. It takes the same arguments. So I don't know why there are two functions with the same code. It's fairly common though. So we'll just call this format number two. So now we can see that, well now we can see what this does. It takes a string buffer and a number and it sets the string buffer to the formatted number. However, it's passing a value we haven't seen before, which is 1. Um, although if you think about it, what 1 really apparently means is just no special treatment. It's not currency, it's not percent, etc. So we'll press N to add a default formatting. Alright, so we'll give this a name. String buffer set number. And we're done with that one now. Now we'll move on to the next one. This appears to be a clone of the string buffer append function. And once again, it's probably I don't know why there's a duplicate, but at least the yeah, meaning of it is clear. So we'll call it append to. If you really cared, we could see which one is used more common commonly, and give that the shorter name. But we won't. This is another number formatting function, except it appends the number. So we'll call it string buffer append number. The next one sets the first four bytes to zero, so that's strange. And the next one does this, so I think we are done with the string buffer functions. I'll go back to these and 
named them unknown one unknown two etc this way if we see them we, even though we don't know what they do we'll at least know that it's something to do with the string buffer so as you can see all these string buffer functions are grouped together in memory so by starting from one address and searching around we were easily able to find others and now I'll just go back and fix the return types And actually, IDA Pro was able to figure out most of the return types on its own after we decompiled the rest of the functions. So that finishes uh, the work decompiling the string buffer. Now we'll go back to WinMain and continue from there. And that'll be the topic of the next video. One note, however, IDA Pro doesn't have a and undo, unfortunately. So it's a good idea to save your work often. So if you screw thing up, you can you don't have to start decompiling again from scratch. Next time we'll uh, decompile a more complex structure, also very important and used throughout the program.